Oh, okay, good. Cool. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, yeah, cool. Um, so thanks for coming out. Uh, today we're going to talk about everyone's favorite project, uh, Solometer. <laughs> um, my name is Gordon Chung. I'm an uh, engineer at Red Hat and the new PTL of Solometer. Um, and I'll let Pratt introduce our topic for today. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. So today we're going to talk about Deploying Solometer, scaling out Solometer. I mean, how many in this room, in the show of hands, are operators who, who try to deploy Solometer? And awesome, perfect. I think you guys will be awesome. like fit right in here. Um, so let's get through some of the obligatory slides here. Um, I'm going to read that mission statement. Meanwhile, you guys can look at the picture. Uh, to reliably collect measurements of the utilization of physical and virtual resources comprising deployed clouds, process this data for subsequent retrieval and analysis, and trigger actions when defined criteria are met. Well, that's a mouthful. Um, what does this really mean, right? So just, just a quick intro to what Solometer is really, you know, what, what we want to do. Um, so that the, the idea being, you know, Solometer is basically you know, used to collect the physical and uh, you know, virtual resources running in your cloud. Um, once you capture these resources you know, into whatever the data that you want, um, if the data is exactly what you need to persist and use, great. If not, you, know, you, you can use some transformers to convert the data to something measurable. Super. Uh, next, we want to publish this data to various targets. So the various targets here are multiple publishers that Solometer supports, right? Um, like HTTP publisher, or I mean, recently we added Kafka publisher. Um, you know, it could be as simple as a file, um, or you know, a notifier publisher. Um, so you know, things like that. You have multiple options here. Um, so now that you publish the data for you know external consumption, whatever it's using it. Um, we also want to persist this data, right? We want to be able to access this data in future uh, for querying or for building, whatever. So we persist this data to storage, um, and then we, we provide a REST API for you to be able to access, you know, for further analysis, you know, building or, you know, coming up with pretty graphs, whatever you want to do. Um, so uh, with that said, you know, let's look at historically how the architecture was. So quickly, I'm not going to go very deep into this architecture. This is ice house based, um, and, and kind of that's where you know Solometer's uh, you know experience came from, or you know what people thought of it. Um, so if you look at this architecture, it's it's very simple. So we have uh, OpenStack services, you know, publishing data to you know the notification bus. Uh, we have polling agents polling off of you know the service APIs, getting the data that way. We have notification agents, you know, grabbing the data off of the notification bus. You know, your collectors getting the data and persisting it in the database. We have an API through which we expose the data. And then, you know, you, you, you basically query the data and do some cool stuff with alarms, with alarm evaluator and notifier, uh, things like that. So this is kind of the basic workflow um, on how things work in, you know, ice house and pretty much even now uh, for the most part. Um, so with that, th there are a lot of limitations, right? I mean, with a given architecture, um, so a couple of things we highlight here. So if you want to, you know, how horizontally scale this whole application as is, um, it's really not possible in Ice House, right? Um, and for example, you know, the, the polling agents, you can, you know, uh, scale that horizontally with, in an active passive manner using Pacemaker. Okay, great, perfect. Uh, notification agents, you could, you could uh, deploy that in HA, um, you know, provided you didn't have uh, um, any transformers associated with it. Um, you know, collectors, um, they, they, you know, it used the RPC publisher, which comes with an overhead, um, and, you know, we fixed that in the later versions, which, which is much more efficient. And, uh, you know, uh, again, the agents, they are pulling off of the services, awesome, but you have one single agent hitting you know, your API, so there's like a heavy API load. Um, and above all, 
we had one single database with all the data dumped into it, right? And you know, we, we, Mongo was the default, of course. We had SQL support, um, but you know, it, it, was, it was a real joke. I mean, it, it didn't scale very well. The queries took like forever. Um, so with this, you know, we, we asked the cloud admins, you know, we spoke to a bunch of people, and hey, what do you guys think of Solometer? Uh, and voila, this was, this was the perception. And this is really not the perception we want, right? I mean, th this says that cloud admins are really scared of Solometer. And, and the, the key here is the word perception, because it's how it's been perceived. You know, it might or might not be true in every case, but that's just how it was perceived. Um, with that, so let's get into some of the complaints that cloud admins had, right? I mean. Uh, yeah, of course, they were, you know, it's obvious that they're scared to deploy this in their uh, data centers, but you know, everyone loves to complain, and you know, that's how we get things fixed, really. Um, so let's look at some of the complaints that people have. Um, number one, API response too slow. So when I run some queries, they just take forever to return. You know, what the hell is Solometer doing there? Uh, when Solometer dies, Glance dies. Uh, I don't know if this is really Solometer's fault. I mean, it, this is probably a bottleneck that Rabbit has or the, the messaging queue that you're using that's getting clobbered because you don't have you know, you know, a limit on the number of messages and that's taking the other services down. So you can't really blame Solometer for that. Um, Solometer has memory leaks, okay, all right. But yeah, I, we can't argue that, I mean, there might be some. Uh, Solometer doesn't scale. Okay, sure. Oh, perfect. I mean, with the architecture that we just spoke about, you know, it's not surprising that it doesn't scale. Um, HA proxy is messing up Mongo replica sets. Again, you know, this is not necessarily Solometer's fault. It's just how, you know, you as a cloud admin have architected your deployment. You know, you, you should figure out whether you need to actually have Mongo with replica sets within that architecture. Maybe you should just move it out. Um, and you know, finally, Solometer is not production ready. I mean, really, we, we heard this over and over. I mean, it's like you know, people moving away from Solometer, you know, either just by word of mouth or you know, they, they tried a few things and they just said production ready. It's not production ready. Um, again, you know, from here on, I mean, there's nothing but you know, going up, right? Uh, that's just how the perception is. So. Now I'll hand it over to Gordon to talk about how Solometer has evolved from here on. So that's kind of where we started or where we came from, and I'm just going to highlight some of the changes we made in the past few cycles. Uh, so this is a similar architecture to what you saw originally, um, but there are some subtle changes to it. Um, so one thing I want to point out is that Solometer itself is composed of several discrete services. Uh, there's a polling. Functional, uh, there's polling functions, um, notification handling, uh, storage, and alarming. Um, and it's possible to run all of them as a complete solution, or if you should choose, you can run each one of them individually if you want. Um, and also, they're designed to scale horizontally, so if you have a large node or load, you can just add more agents to cope with that. Uh, but specifically in Juno, what we did was we started to focus on some of the core issues around storage and also the durability of our services. Uh, one thing we did was we split off the alarms database into its own section. Um, we also updated the SQL database backend to kind of simplify the model. Uh, originally, the model had a lot of weird relationships that we needed to handle both the V1 and V2 models of our API. Uh, but in Juno, we deprecated the, or we dropped the V1 API, and we were able to simplify the model quite a bit, and it ended up, we, ended, we ended up storing a lot less data, and it improved performance dramatically. Um, another thing we did in Juno was we added Oslo messaging support. Um, so basically, what it can do now is it publishes to a topic rather than using RPC, which has a certain overhead to it. Um, and this also allows a lot more flexibility in that because we're publishing to a topic, you can have not, right now the collector by default will consume message off the queue, but you can ther theoretically use any 
consumer to take that, the data from the queue. Um, and just that, yeah, just flexibility there. And the last thing we did was we added coordinated HA for our polling agents. Um, and we used a tool called Twos, uh, and I'll go into that. So basically, Twos is how we handle our coordination between agents. Um, it's a group membership tool that some of the guys at Innovance created a, few, a while back. Uh, it supports various backends like Redis, Memcache, Zookeeper. And the basic premise of it is that when you have an agent, it knows about all the resources it, it can pull. And when it starts up, it will register with twos, and it will find out all the other agents that are live and active. And from that, it uses a hash ring to kind of bucketize some of the resources so it knows what resources it needs to pull. It doesn't actually, so it, the one benefit of that is that it's kind of ignorant to everything else. It just knows what it, it's kind of lightweight and knows exactly what it needs to do and doesn't actually care about what other agents are doing. Um, so it's similar to, some, I think, what Ironic does in its conductor. And so every time you start or you add or drop an agent, you'll register with twos and it'll broadcast the new or the new uh, members of a group and it will redistribute the resources accordingly. And in Kilo, we kind of further went with the same uh, idea of just kind of supporting discrete services. Um, in the pipeline, we added support for Kafka and HTTP, HTTP publishing. So again, if you don't want to use Salama for storage, you can push it to another queue or to another HTTP target and consume the data that way. Um, we also added the same coordination uh, technique to the notification agents. So you can have multiple notification, notification agents and if, they are, if there's transformers, it's fine. Um, we also added better event support. Uh, so in Salometer, we capture both metrics uh, metering, measurement data, as well as events that happen within the OpenStack uh, system. Uh, so the, we originally had that in Ice House, but it was kind of completed within in the Kilo cycle. So it, it functions similar to how we capture meters. Uh, you can push them through pipelines and publish them to multiple topics or destinations. And also we split off the events DB. So now there are three databases. Uh, metering, one for meters, one for events, and one for alarms, but they can also be just one database if you want. Um, also for Elastic, um, for events, we added support for Elasticsearch, which is really good for full text uh, querying. Uh, I won't go too much into that. We, I have a session later on that talks about that if you are interested. And lastly, we added, added support for, uh, we added jitter support, so basically it's a, random delay across all the polling agents so that not all the polling agents are hitting the service APIs at the exact same time. All right. All right, so, so far we spoke about, you know, the problems that Solometer has, the complaints that a lot of people have, and, you know, how it has evolved. You know, regardless of how Solometer has evolved so far, you know, unless, you know, you as a cloud admin, you know, or an operator follow certain best practices, you know, and, you know, learn your software uh, that you're deploying, you're always going to have issues, you know, regardless of, you know, what application you're deploying, you know, you can complain all you want, but if you're not following certain things, it's, you know, it's, it's obviously going to have certain, some issues. So we, we saw a bunch of complaints so far. But, you know, as, as I was mentioning, not everything was Solometer's fault, really. I mean, there are other bottlenecks that, that was bringing down Solometer or the performance was impacted by other applications that are running behind Solometer. Um, so it's, it's always better to understand, you know, as a whole, how you're deploying the application, what it involves, and then, you know, deploy it based on, you, you know, your needs. So with that, let's, let's go over some of the best practices. You know, th this is just a subset. I mean, uh, uh, you should probably read about uh, you know, other things and uh, you know, see what fits your needs. Um, so to begin with, you know, 
Solometer gives you a world of data. You know, cloud is a very, very complex application. Um, and you get tons and tons of data that's been generated by so many applications, that, so many uh, pro projects that Solometer uh, OpenStack is running. Um, having said that, if, if you choose to you know, collect everything, I mean, if that's what you, your uh, deployment needs, sure, I mean, you know, no arguments there. But you know, most likely, 90% of the cases, you, know, you, you have certain metrics that matter to you most. I mean, so certain things that you really don't care. So we have something called a pipeline.yaml where you can go and you know, prune you know, which metrics that you want to collect, which you want to um, you know, uh, keep away. That way, number one, you know, your data is, is pristine to what your needs are. So your, quer your queries aren't going to take too long because you're not collecting like, data that you don't really care about. Um, you know, when you're querying, you know, things are going to be much faster. Your database sizes will be, you know, a at least you, know, you don't have needless data that you need to worry about. Um, so you know, things like that, that's one of the best practices. Um, again, po polling intervals, you know, there's a default polling, but if you want to you know, tweak it to your needs, you know, maybe you don't want to uh, you know, poll every you know, uh, 20 minutes or whatever. Instead, you want to poll like twice a day. Sure, you know, go and tweak that. That way, you're not you know, putting load on other service APIs you know, unnecessarily, right? Um, and jittering to polling, this, this is something that we added in Kilo. Um, so imagine a scenario where you have, I don't know, 1,000 compute agents running, right? And, and imagine a situation where all the 1,000 compute agents are trying to talk to the Nova, Nova API at the exact same time. That's a huge load on your Nova API. Versus, you know, you can enable this jittering. What, what this jittering does is it, it adds a random delay in, you know, how each of these agents are talking to the APIs. That way, you are kind of distributing the load and, you know, moving it around. That way, you know, the Nova APIs are not, you know, hit by uh, the agents all at once. And, and again, th this is something that you can easily turn on in the config file. Um, scaling out, uh, you know, add uh, agents uh, as the load increases. So this is, this is something that you as a cloud admin should know best, you know, how your infrastructure is scaling, how, how much load is coming, at what, what, what point of time. So, you know, use your best judgment and, you know, add, add more agents based on your needs. You know, that way, you know, you, you are, you, are uh, you know, addressing the problem ahead of time before, you know, your application goes down for heavy loads while you have, you know, few agents that are not handling the load properly. Uh, this is something I mentioned earlier. So instead of using the RPC publisher, use the notifier publisher. It's, it's much more scalable. It uses Oslo messaging. Uh, RPC comes with a, a overhead, so, you know, you can avoid that because now that we have that support in Juno. All right, um, so some of the data store practices. So you know, we, have, we have heard a lot of complaints about you know, Mongo doesn't scale or you know, the backend is uh, you know, taking too much space. So there, there, are, there are certain things that you can do. So for example, the queries, right? I mean, make sure your queries are you know, full formed. Don't, don't do open-ended queries. And you know, obviously, it's going to take a lot more time if you just want to you know, query tons and tons of data by just a single point. Um, instead, you know, have a full-formed queries. Um, run Solometer uh, behind ModWSG. Uh, the advantage is that it gives you a lot more knobs to tweak. Um, so you, you, for example, in, in, the, in your Apache configuration, you can add the number of threads and processes that you know, Apache needs to spawn. So that way, you are kind of distributing the load and your API can scale much better. Uh, set the T TTL, so of course, so this is, uh, again, th this is probably one of the best practices for you know, other applications. It's not necessarily Solometer, any application you're running. So if you have a database, you know, and especially in Solometer case, we, we capture so much data that you know, it always makes sense to figure out what data that you really need. You know, how much do you want to keep, you know, keep the data? You know, if you have years worth of data, do you really need it? You know, or maybe do you, you only care about last week's or last month's data? So figure out what's, what's best for your infrastructure and your needs. 
Um, similarly, Mongo, right? So don't run Mongo on the same node as the API. I mean, that's just, that's just basic common sense, right? Just put it on a separate node. That way, you know, number one, it makes you know, the, the load and as well as the space, all those constraints on a separate node and you don't, just don't have to worry about, you know, oh, my, my API is not scaling or, you know, oh, I, I see a bunch of errors in the logs. Oh, it looks like you just ran out of space and you were running the API on the exact same box as Mongo. So just move it to another box and uh, or another node and just, just that way you, you are isolating the problem in case you have issues in future, at least you know that it is Mongo and not necessarily Solometer's code. Um, again, when you're running Mongo, enable sharding and replica sets, you know, just don't run Mongo, you know, as is, you know, use replication, use sharding, you know, that, that helps scale, you know, much better. So the, the bottom line with all these is, you know, you as an operator, you as a cloud admin, try to learn the application, try to learn what, what takes for me to deploy Solometer and figure out what are the best practices for me to follow to deploy this instead of, you know, obviously every application out there, every project out there has some issue or another. It's, it's just that, you know, how big a problem it is. And, you know, if you think Mongo is the problem, you know, may, maybe you can investigate different backend for your needs. Uh, but again, it's not necessarily Solometer's fault. I mean, we're not saying Solometer's perfect. I mean, Solometer has issues, absolutely. But you know, so, so does other projects. But you know, so you, you need to understand what your needs are and follow some of the best practices. That way, you, know, you, you can have some better experience in future. Uh, with that, go ahead. Um, cool. Uh, so, I mentioned, so as I mentioned before, there, Solometer is composed of multiple discrete services, so you can kind of deploy it in many different ways to suit your needs. Um, so I was, I'll run through a few uh, deployments that I've seen or are possible with Solometer. Uh, so this is the Lambda design. The basic premise of the Lambda design is there's like a fast path and a slow path. Um, so in this case, we support, our pipeline supports publishing to uh, multiple targets. Uh, in this scenario, you would take a single data point and publish it to two different places. Uh, you'll have a short-term database, which would have maybe a shorter uh, time to live setting, so you would expire data quicker, and you'd have another archive database that would kind of keep more data. Um, the short-term path, obviously, you'd it would you'd send a, it'd be more for kind of time-sensitive uh, queries. So if you for alarms such for Example, if you use alarms, you can probably set that against a short-term data database so you can get your uh, queries back quicker. Um, and for the archive one, if that's more for queries that if you, you're okay with waiting a few minutes or hours, <laughs> then that's also that path for that one. Um, the next one is data segregation. Um, this one is similar to the Lambda design. Uh, for this one, the use case is if you have two, data, two different data points, um, one of them being, I don't know, CPU utilization. You would send that to the public data store. And if you had more, uh, more sensitive data, like audit data, you would send that to the audit database. And you'd have two different APIs controlling, controlling access to these databases uh, to meet the required uh, access control. So Solometer itself also allows you to not just store in, write into databases, but also write JSON files. Uh, so there are some big data tools out there that can consume JSON files, like Apache Spark. So you theoretically could write to a JSON file and have that load into Apache Spark and do your data processing that way. Fraud detection. Um, so this is what I did with the previous company. Um, what we did was we had a proprietary learning system. Uh, so we didn't actually use Slammer's uh, storage or alarms. We just sent all the data via HTTP to our own system and we would build our rules and alarms that way. Custom consumers. <laughs> we also in Kilo supported Kafka. Uh, 
And one of the consumers of Kafka is Apache Storm, which is similar to Apache Spark. Um, so yeah, this is also an option if you want to go, that one, go down that route, uh, if you're familiar with both of these tools. Uh, I should add a disclaimer that none of these tools are actually part of Solometer. You can use them like, as an extension, but Solometer itself doesn't include these tools. Debugging. Um, so in, in addition to metrics, we also collect event data, which is kind of notification. So every service emits notifications on kind of the state of the resources, it, uh, the state of a resource it has. And Slumber consumes that and builds metrics out of it, but also builds events. And using that, you can send that data into Elasticsearch and use Kibana or Slumber's API to query that data uh, and kind of do deep diving into it and kind of see what data is, a, is available. And the last scenario is noisy services. So there are certain services out there that will emit significantly more um, notifications than other services. Uh, so one of the things that Slumber can do is it listens to multiple notification buses. So you can actually have, it can consume from multiple places. So if you have one that's particularly noisy, you could, could have that on its own dedicated service so you don't overflow the bus and have some of the more quieter ones on its own bus. So where do we go from here? Uh, now, I'm just going to highlight some of the goals we have for Liberty. Um, so you might have heard of this term called Noki that's been flowing around. Uh, it's a pasta. It's also, it's also a storage mechanism we're doing on, or we've been building. Some of the Solometer developers have been working on that for the last few cycles, and we'll talk more about that next, but it's something we're looking to make as a viable backend in the library uh, cycle. We also, in Kilo, we've, we've been working on events, and we hope to kind of extend that functionality in the upcoming cycle, uh, just do alarming on events, and maybe build, add some, the ability to transform or build alarms, uh, build <laughs> samples from the events, sorry. And lastly, we have a design session around de declarative uh, data collection. So right now, to collect data or metrics, we actually write code to build that, um, which is very restrictive. If you add something mid-cycle or beyond, you, it's kind of hard to like bring in master constantly. So what we want to do is, uh, load in a file, like declare our metrics in a file so you can actually load that in and not have to write code. And that should improve the flexibility of our data collection. And lastly, I think for me, when I ran for PTL, the, basic, the main goal was to minimize the bloat. Like we, we will add new features to Slometer, but we want to make sure whatever we do that Slometer remains as lightweight as possible. Noki, uh, anyone hungry yet? Yeah. Um, so, w what is Noki? So, as uh, Gordon mentioned, uh, this is a project that Julian started, um, you know, kind of to address some of the performance problems that Solometer has. Um, so, to to kind of give you a very high-level overview, I'm, I'm just going to trigger your taste buds here. Um, you know, go and read about it. There are other sessions that you know. Um, Owen and Julianne presented in the Paris Summit, which goes in very detailed on what Noki is. Um, so what, what's Noki? Noki is resource metering as a service. So in Solometer, you know, as, as we discussed, all the data is kind of treated as you know, a single data point, right? I mean, we, we don't really differentiate between you know, what is a meter, what is the metadata associated with it. It's all one giant blob that goes into the database. Um, what Noki does is it kind of you know, differentiates the, you know, the data into kind of two categories. So one is metrics. These, these are more like, you know, single point in time. These are like time series data that are very lightweight, which we just care about, like the value of it. And then 
we, we look at another data point, which is the resource that, that kind of maps to this measurement. So think of resource as you know, an instance, or a volume, right, or uh, an image. Right? And a metric, a measurement here is you know, the, the CPU utilization of the instance, or you know, the size of the image, or you know, the number of disks in a volume. So it's, it's a measurement. So what Noki does is it kind of separates these two into, like, it, it realizes that these are two separate problems to deal with and uses the right tools to handle them appropriately. So it, it uses this light, lightweight time series you know, data. So we have this uh, concept called a storage and an indexer. So the storage is kind of responsible for this time series data, which you know, by default we have something called a carbonara. Uh, again, yummy. Uh, so it is like Swift plus um, you know, Pandas based, you know, a canonical implementation. Um, and you can also, th there are other patches uh, to support InfluxDB and you know, OpenTSDB and you know, a similar uh, databases to support the like, like kind of data. And then the indexer, uh, it, it, it stores all the resource information and it maps the resource to the metric. And the measurement is in, in your storage and you basically add the measurements to the metric. So this way, you're handling the right amount of, the right type of data with the appropriate tools without you know, handling everything with like one giant tool, which could be Mongo or which could be MySQL or whatever in Salamator. Um, and, and again, it, it, it comes with a you know, few other you know, nice little features. So we do like pre-aggregation, eager pre-aggregation. So in, in Salamator, when you make a query, all the aggregation is done on demand, right? I mean, you make a query and everything is going on behind the scenes right there. Versus in Noki, we actually do eager pre-aggregation. Um, and similarly, we have support for cross-metric entity. This is, this is mostly for like, you know, auto-scaling with heat. So if you have multiple instances and, you know, you want to take the measurements off of, you know, multiple uh, resources. Um, and, and again, you, so we have retention policies. So you can define a retention policy on a per metric basis. So again, Noki realizes that you, know, you, you, you don't want a single retention policy for your entire data, right? I want to retain uh, in a CPU utilization metrics one way and you know, disk metrics another way. So you kind of you know, can define on a per metric basis how long you want to keep one versus the other. So these are some of like, the advantages of you know, Noki, and, and it's, it's addressing the problem with the right tools the right way. So, and, and you know, it, it, it looks pretty promising. Um, so, you know, th this is a very good, uh, you know, example of, you know, Noki versus Salometer data point. So if you see the amount of data that Salometer stores on a per data point basis versus in Noki, it's just the timestamp and the value. So it, it has much, much smaller footprint. It's going to be much more performant. And, you know, it's, it's pretty obvious from this little picture, you know, why. So we don't need to go much deep into that. Um, so we have some metrics that uh, Mehdi, you know, collected. Uh, this, this is basically using 10, you know, clients parallelly posting, you know, doing post requests 100 times for 100 measurements. Um, so this is, these are the post measurements and these are the get measurements. So you, you kind of see the performance. This is for Swift based and he also has a blog post where he, he, he focuses on the Ceph implementation as well. So you kind of get the idea of, you know, if you want to use canonical Swift versus you want to use Ceph as the, you know, back end. Um, and the performance is uh, pre pretty, pretty on par for both uh, if you go and look at it. Um, so with that, I'll pass it on to uh, Gordon to you know, talk about where exactly Noki fits into our future architecture. Cool. Um, so this is how Noki fits in. The basic idea is that your alarm evaluator will now query the Noki API, which should significantly speed up your, the, your statistic queries, because it's already pre-aggregated. Um, and this would be how you deploy it. <laughs> Uh, so, tomorrow we actually have an operator's discussion uh, or op session where you guys can, I think a lot of Salamer developers will be there and we can chat about what needs to be fixing. Uh, we also have a few design tr uh, tracks on Thursday, or Wednesday and Thursday. 
Uh, the main topics we have are event alarms and slumber componentization, but there's also a few other ones that we will be working on. I don't know if you're free, you're welcome to join. Uh, and I'm gonna do a self plug here. Uh, on Thursday, I also have a talk where we show how we use slumber events to debug an environment. So, yeah. And also, I guess, as always, there's IRC. If you want to ping us with questions and the mailing list, just tag it with Slometer, and someone will answer. Uh, this is just to highlight some of the resources that, or some of the stuff we've been talking about. Uh, you can kind of jump into these links if you want and kind of learn more about what we've been talking about. And oops. <laughs> That concludes our talk. Thanks. Oh, there's beer, I think. <laughs> <laughs>